Awesome. Hi, everyone. So welcome. My name is Megan and welcome to another Blue Coat Talk. And I'm here today with a super special guest. This is Tiffany. And Tiffany, hi. Uh, Tiffany is the conservation outreach and field biologist with Wildlife Preservation Canada, which you may hear us refer to as WPC accidentally throughout the throughout our talk today. But yeah, Wildlife Preservation Canada is a very cool organization that does all kinds of amazing conservation work here in Canada. So, uh, and today we're going to talk about probably one of my most favorite things in the entire world, which I'm sure Tiffany can agree, and that is bees and bumblebees specifically. So I'm super pumped for this chat. Um, and before we begin, I want to quickly uh, and importantly acknowledge that we here in Sudbury, uh, I'm in the Science Center today, and that we are on the traditional and ancestral lands of the Atikamikshing, Anishinaabe, and Wanapate First Nation. I would also like to acknowledge the Métis Nation for their cultural and economic contribution in this area. These lands sit in the Robinson-Huron Treaty area, and as we are all treaty people, it is important for all of us to be thinking about what treaty area we live in, if, excuse me, and are in an active part. Let's take a moment today to appreciate the land that we are on. Um, Tiffany, would you like to share where you're coming from today? Yeah, of course. I will share the Guelph Region Acknowledgement, since this is where Wildlife Preservation Canada is headquartered. Uh, but of course, Megan and I invite everyone to consider their own position with regards to the land on which they find themselves. Uh, so I know everybody could be tuning in from different areas today. So Guelph, Ontario is situated on the homelands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Attawada Runs people, and on the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. However, our teams work across Turtle Island and we recognize the diversity of Indigenous people who have and continue to steward these lands. Awesome, amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Tiffany. Um, okay, so really quickly, so again, we're gonna be talking about bees and bumblebees. And if you have any bumblebee question or just bee questions in general or pollinator questions, Tiffany, Tiffany and I can certainly uh, do our best to answer those, but put them in the chat and we'll work them into our conversation. So I'm super pumped for this because um, this is one of many blue coat talks that we've done throughout uh, the past you know year and a bit. And if you haven't already liked and subscribed and shared on all of our social media channels, please go ahead and do that. And also check out Wildlife Preservation Canada's Instagram page because I'm a big fan of it. I I follow it and it's really, really amazing. And I'm hoping that Tiffany will share some of that cool work that you're gonna do with us or that you guys do with us today. And so let's get into the bees because that's what everyone here is for. So um, let's start off, Tiffany, if you could give us a kind of a, a day in the life of what you do at WPC. Oh, that's a great question. So under my position, I lead all the field work as well as the community outreach. And that really looks different depending on what time of the year it is. Uh, so my favorite part of you know my whole job as well as the year is our spring season. So between very late April um, and I would say mid-June, we conduct our annual queen spring surveys. Uh, so we go out and survey at sites all across Ontario looking for these queen bumblebees that have just emerged um, from their winter hibernation. So really cool. Um, it's super intensive, kind of six to eight weeks where we go out, catch as many bumblebees as we can. So for about two months of my job, every day is going out, driving to different sites, um, looking at all the flowers that are in bloom there, going out and catching the bumblebees. If definitely one of the coolest and most rewarding experiences I've ever had. Imagine getting paid to run around, collect bees off flowers. I can't imagine a more perfect life. <laughs> and so we collect, um, not only are we just monitoring species across Ontario, but we collect queens that are, um, depends on year to year. This year we collected common species, uh, but typically we collect species at risk. So ones that are a little bit more rare in decline, which makes it more of like a treasure hunt, really, when you're going out and collecting bees. Um, and we bring them back home to our little captive breeding lab where we try to raise um, self-sustaining colonies. 
So for those two months, it's a quite busy. It's out and about all the time. But for the rest of the season, it could look like doing talks like this, running workshops, doing bee walks in a non-COVID time. So hopefully happening again soon. And then, you know, doing a lot of the work for what NGOs do. I mean, it's a lot of grant writing, a lot of proposals, um, trying to get funding, everything like that. So really the job changes quite a bit throughout the year, but um, I love every part of it. That's amazing. Um, I think that a few uh, years in a row, um, there was a team that actually came to Sudbury and did some queen collecting, right? Yeah, normally, so this year, of course, would be a little bit different with kind of restrictions. But over the last few years, we have a, a couple crews stationed around Ontario. So typically, we have a crew that does Guelph and kind of GTA region. We have a crew, uh, crew story that's stationed in Sudbury. And then over the three years we did this kind of style, I stationed the Thunder Bay crew. So a little bit more up north just to try to get as much coverage across Ontario as we could. Right. That's amazing. So when you say that you're catching bees, <laughs> um, I, I don't know if everyone out there kind of understands what that means. So maybe give us a little bit of a breakdown. Like when you're catching a bee, are you like, here, bee, now you're in my right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so We've got some, some pretty cool equipment. So uh, we've got, I would say they're about 12 foot extendable, really long net um, because Depending on what the bees are on, sometimes they're trees in the spring, if you think about your apple trees, right. uh, or sometimes it's dandelion in the spring. So that's, you know, really close to the ground. Does it require too much extension? Uh, so we carry along these big nets and we do a lot of different sweeping techniques to catch them off flowers. And then we carry little vials that's got holes poked in the top. So they have um, air circulation through there. Um, we put the vials into the nets, capture the bees, and we'll do a couple of little data things. We'll label what they were foraging on or if they were just flying, um, what time we caught them, species, if it's a male or a queen or a worker. Um, and then we actually carry these cute little cooler bags, very stylish, um, with some ice packs in there. And we put all our little vials in there to keep the, bull, <laughs> keep the bees sorry, <laughs> in the vials nice and cool and they're not too stressed out. And um, we'll carry them all in that for the duration of our survey, which could be anywhere from 30 minutes to four hours in some years. Um, and that makes it really easy to ID later because they're really cold and really slow and you can also pop them onto a flower um, for great photos. But the net's really the key component here for sure. <laughs> like running around. <laughs> That's awesome. So once you ID them, um, so, so in case everyone is wondering, there are lots of different species of bumblebee. And I, and I think that even before I started um, kind of learning more about our native pollinators, right? You think I'm like, oh yeah, bumblebee. It's the same as all the other bumblebees. But no, there are many different species, right, Tiffany? Yeah, there are. I think I would probably was on the same page. Um, I think bumblebee is just kind of grouped into one single thing, uh, but it's actually a genus, so a much larger group. Um, although small compared to most of our bee species, but there's about 46 species across North America and about probably 25 um, whose range kind of extend into Ontario to some extent. So I would say more commonly, probably around 18 or so. Wow. Yeah, we've got bees and on not just Ontario, but in North America, that have got like red, yellow, um, orange, white, brown, more incredible colors than you would have imagined than just the typical yellow and black. That's awesome. So maybe it's, I think maybe it might be helpful then to give everyone watching an idea of like how you would identify a bumblebee. Obviously we know there's lots of species and they all sort of differ a little bit, but if you're looking at a pollinator and there's something on a flower, like how would you know, be like, oh, that's probably a bumblebee as opposed to like a honeybee or a leaf cutter bee? Yeah, it's definitely, it's definitely hard. There's so many bees. We have, I think, it's over 4,000 species of bees in general in North America, so also probably a much larger number than you thought. Um, I think if you're thinking early spring, I think it's the easiest to differentiate them because those queens we mentioned come out of hibernation in the spring. So one of the first things that really sets them apart from other bees is their size. They're quite large, uh, anywhere from probably this to this. Um, we've got quite large species. The closest size comparison would be like a typically large carpenter bee um, to a queen of a bumblebee. Uh, the second good characteristic is they're very hairy. 
So they're large, they're very hairy. A lot of other bees, um, they might have a hairy thorax. So that kind of bulbous part, like that sits right behind the head where their legs are attached to. Uh, but usually the rest of their abdomen is quite shiny. Uh, so a good example of this would be like the honeybee, which most right. of you probably know what that looks like. Very stripy, very shiny. Um, but for bumblebees, they have hair that goes all the way down the abdomen. So they're big, they're very fuzzy, they're very hairy. <laughs> and yeah, there's there's a lot of species to look at. So even coloration, like I said, really changes between right. them. But I think when you're looking at that size and just how hairy they are, and once you get used to kind of looking at you know, eye placement, they have very thin, um, narrow eyes compared to something like flies that have really big compound eyes that need in the center of the face. There's definitely a few characteristics to differentiate them from flies and wasps, but it does get a little bit trickier when you're looking at just bees. Yeah, for sure. I know there's um, some false sumac just outside on the third floor here, and it is covered in bees all the time, like four or five different species of bumblebee at one time, leafcutter bees, there's minor bees, obviously honeybees because we have an apiary, so there's lots of bees. Uh, types even on one single plant so that's amazing so you, you mentioned um you know the queen the worker and the drone which may be familiar to some people if they know a little bit about honeybees and beekeeping uh, and that those three casts are very common amongst um amongst bee species right so can you give us a little bit of some details about what makes them each a little bit different yeah, and this kind of goes hand in hand with talking about the, the colony cycle a little bit, which I think is really interesting when we talk about a, a lot of our native species, because it actually differs quite a bit from honeybees. Um, so in that kind of winter hibernation, there'll be a mated queen from the previous summer. So she'll come up in early spring, and this can look a little bit different depending on the species, but typically I would say uh, in Ontario anyway, it's around late April um, to even early June for some species. Um, so this will be a queen again that really big one she's quite large she'll go around she'll start foraging she's been you know hibernating she's hard she's hungry who wouldn't be hungry after that and what she's really looking for is a new nest to raise her colony so she knows that's her mission uh, so she'll start looking for that spot to raise her first brood so this is what we call the workers so these are female like the queen um, and typically they're like little miniature versions of that queen sometimes they can look slightly different in pattern uh, but usually very similar and workers have all kinds of jobs um, once you kind of build up how many workers are in the colony you'll have workers that go out and forage you'll have workers that help incubate brood clean up the nest um, there's even records of air conditioning bees where they'll kind of stand at the nest entrance and fan it to cool it down it's pretty incredible um, and then you move fast forward to a little bit later in the season um, typically this is around late summer um, i would say end of august typically in most years, you'll start seeing the males come out. So these are produced. Um, they are very variable in pattern, typically hard to ID. And they look a little bit stranger compared to some other bumblebees because they have a couple different segments in places, but their primary purpose is to go out and mate with new queens of other colonies. So they don't stay in the colony, they don't forage or anything like that. Um, so around the same time as the males are produced, new queens are produced. So this is at the very end of the colony cycle. And this is how you know a colony has been successful. So we call these gynes, very fancy term. So these new queens will go out and mate with those males of other colonies. And it'll be that queen that'll hibernate until the next spring and make a new colony. So they only have annual colonies. So everybody else in the colony actually dies. It'll just be the gynes that survive. So... Will the queen make just one queen or is she going to make many queens at the end of the season? She can make multiple for sure. Um, I've seen several come out of a single colony. I think it also depends on maybe how many resources they have. Um, but yeah, definitely multiple can come out of a, a single colony for sure. Wow. Okay. That is very similar to like how bumblebee colony sort of works. But the big difference there is that they're seasonal, right? So um you know bumblebees like the colony will sort of die at the end of the season except for those new queens those gynes whereas mm -hmm. a honey colony like they hibernate in their in their hive all winter but with the help of a beekeeper they don't do it all by themselves which i think is a really big big difference um mm -hmm. so <laughs> 
So this is kind of it's kind of a funny story, but um, when we were chatting about setting this up, uh, you at one point said, "I can't meet on this day because I'm going to be in the breeding trailer," and I just thought that that was like there's not every day where you hear somebody say, "I'm going to be in the breeding trailer that day, so I can't chat." Um, can you can you elaborate on what that is? Because I'm also very curious. <laughs> So I mentioned that when we do our surveys in the spring, we, we collect certain queens. So this year, um, as Megan mentioned, sometimes we have multiple crews. So typically we bring yellow banded bumblebee queens. So this is a species of special concern. Uh, we normally bring them from further up north because they're not as common here. But because we didn't have northern crews stationed this year, um, we decided to kind of work more on, you know, perfecting, so to speak, our be breeding program. So we just collected common species here. Uh, so in our surveys, if we found this particular queen of interest um, without pollen, uh, because when they start collecting pollen on their hind legs, um, that's a good indicator that she's already started a colony because uh, she's bringing that back to pack for her brood. Um, so if we see they don't have pollen, they look like they're in condition, we'll bring them back to our breeding lab. So this is where we set them up in like artificial nest boxes. We provide them all their nectar as well as their pollen. So we, we make all of that ourselves in house. Excellent chef, if we do say so ourselves. <laughs> and um, yeah, we monitor them uh, every other day. We go in and we feed them. Um, we check out what they're doing. So they bumblebees do a really neat thing where they build um, all nests of bees are quite fascinating, actually. But they build what they call little uh, nectar pots or wax pots. So they'll actually make kind of just like little bowls really made out of wax and they put all their nectar in there and then they make little capsules where they put their brood cells in. So you can start seeing when they're trying to start developing something. So we'll count how many cells we see, how many nectar pots are they filled. Um, and then when the colonies get quite big, so we've got colonies with about, I think 30 workers or so. I was just there yesterday. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff going on. Then you start looking at how many workers are there. Um, are there males in the colony already? Um, later in the season, we would start looking for the guys. Um, so it's really just monitoring them over time. Um, we're actually running some pollen experiments right now, which I don't know too much myself. I'm not as involved with that, but a different project this year. But typically working with the species at risk, the long-term goal is that we would have these self-sustaining colonies in the lab that we could reintroduce some of those individuals, so those guys into areas in which we used to find that species more commonly. Okay, so that's the main goal is to reintroduce the, the species at risk. So um, yeah. I know earlier you mentioned the yellow banded bumblebee, which is a species of special concern. Are there any other species of uh, that are at risk here in Ontario? Yeah, we have a few others. So we have the yellow banded bumblebee, so that's kind of on what they might say kind of a lower level, so it is special concern. Um, we have the rusty patch bumblebee, which was really big in media for a certain period of time, so maybe familiar uh, to some of you here today, but she has not been found since 2009 at Pinery Park here. Um, so currently it's looking like it might be extirpated in its range, so we can't find it here in Canada anymore, but it still is being found in its American range. Um, so actually our program was initially made for that species and we planned on captive breeding that, but we haven't found a single individual despite running surveys at Pinery uh, since 2015, I believe. Um, so that's one that would be really great to find, but unfortunately it's not looking great. And that was a very extremely common species um, in the 70s, I believe. Uh, then we have actually um, a cuckoo bumblebee. So these are types, it's kind of like a subgenus of bumblebees. Um, you might know of cuckoo birds, other cuckoos and other taxonomic groups. So they parasitize other bumblebees. So we have a gypsy cuckoo bumblebee who's also endangered like the rusty patch and its host was the rusty patch. So that's a cool relationship that you see one decline of the host, you see decline of the parasitic host. Um, that one same thing also hasn't been seen around since 2009, I think also at Pinery. Um, and then we have a few other species that are a little bit more up north. We have um, Suckley's cuckoo, so that's another bumblebee, and one of its hosts is the yellow-banded bumblebee, for example. Um, and I think the few others are a little bit more towards out west, actually. Um, the only other one I believe here, it's not actually listed under the Species at Risk Act yet, uh, but was assessed by Kasebic. And that's the American bumblebee. Looks quite similar to the yellow banded bumblebee, but that's assessed to be somewhere at special concern as well. So that's kind of the newest one that got added to the list, I think in 2018. So still fairly recent. Okay. 
Okay, so um, so I think that this. I don't think there's anybody <laughs> who may be watching today, uh, which again, just as a reminder, if you guys have any questions, please pop them in the comments. Um, there's definitely a few people watching um, from Englehart, Sault Ste. Marie, and then here in Sudbury. So you're coming from everywhere today to, to watch us today, Tiffany. Um, but when we're thinking about, you know, uh, you know, conservation, I think Save the Bees has been one of the most uh ubiquitous things that i've heard now obviously i'm very attached to bumblebees so i probably or bees in general so i hear it all the time but um so maybe let's chat about that like so if if bumblebees are species at risk and some of them are, are declining um what uh, can we do like are there is there anything that we can do to help them yeah so there's a lot of good things when you're helping one group of pollinators um, inherently, you're helping lots of other groups as well. So even if um, so, good classic things, planting, of course. Um, you want to focus on native species. You want different colors and sizes. Um, bumblebees also can be categorized by their tongue length. So they have short tongues to long tongues. So you'll actually see different species kind of, you know, focus more on different plants or can access different plants better. So you always want a variety with like most things. Um, and I can post a little thing in the chat in just a second of some good examples of what you can plant. Um, but remember how I mentioned that, so we've got the queens who come out very early spring and their colonies really go until very early fall. I've seen colonies still around, around Thanksgiving, to be honest, right before there, those new dimes. Um, I would say they typically taper off in September, but I've seen some hang around a bit longer depending on if it's already snowed and kind of how cold it is. So you need plants that go through that whole season. Um, that's a lot of different things you might need to be thinking about because um, they need to be able to forage through that whole colony cycle. Um, so really having that difference of, you know, plants and having those different bloom times are really important for them. Um, and another good thing is just providing habitat for them. This is a good reason not to rake all of your property and leave it a little bit messy. Um, they like to nest, you know, in undisturbed places. Sometimes it's really tall, thatchy grass. Sometimes it's in your garden bed, which is why you might see a lot of the time where they say don't rake too early in the spring or too late in the fall because those guys actually might go hibernate in that area. Um, so just really taking care of that natural space that you have around you is really important. Um, you know, that might be just a, a big or sorry, a small patch to you, but like that's sometimes a whole world to a different bee. So that's really important. And um, the last great thing that we have um, is we have Bumblebee Watch. So if you're ever interested in getting involved in a community science platform from home, this is a great opportunity to do that. So Bumblebee Watch is either you can use it as an app on your phone or um, just the website simply on a browser. So the whole purpose is you're taking photos of bumblebees. So this could be right on flowers in your garden. You upload them to Bumblebee Watch and it takes you through a whole kind of identification key. It'll ask you questions about what the bee looks like to help you narrow down the species of bumblebee. And then experts such as myself will come in and we actually verify what the bee is. So maybe your ID was correct, maybe it wasn't, but I'll tell you what actually was in your garden. And then you can really kind of build up what kind of diversity you have in your garden. But this one, so it's kind of like an iNaturalist platform, but this is specific just to bumblebees. Um, so we only do bumblebee stuff, but the data goes to really great use. It helps assess species. So that American bumblebee that I mentioned earlier, that was assessed in 2018. Um, bumblebee watch data was used to help do that. Um, helps us find rare and at risk species and helps us plan survey sites. It's, it's a really great platform for people to get involved. And it's kind of fun to find out what's in your garden, so. Absolutely. I think Megan was just saying she's been seeing some yellow banded at home, so that's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I use I am a user of that app and I love it. And we actually run a couple of different workshops here at Science North that are targeted to doing citizen science. So uh and and Bumblebee Watch is one of the ones that we do, which is which is a lot of fun and it's it's very validating when you get an ID correct and then the scientist emails you and says you got it. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> it's awesome. It's a lot of fun. Definitely. If anyone watching today, um, hasn't tried it out, definitely check it out. It's a very cool app. And, and like, um, Tiffany said, like, you don't need to catch the bumblebees. You just need to take pictures of them on the flowers. And generally speaking, 
while bumblebees or, or bees in general are foraging, they're usually really relaxed because they're just doing what they're doing. They Bees tend to only get a little bit uh, aggressive or a little bit um, bumpy while they're while they're protecting their their hive right so it's they're usually pretty chill <laughs> yeah and they're, they're also really well known for kind of sticking to the same type of flowers when they're foraging it's something bumblebees are really well known for so if they're foraging on a particular plant in your garden and there's multiple when they move they typically just move to another one of those so sometimes you can quite easily follow them um like kind of tips for photos. Yeah, as Megan said, they, they stay a lot longer on a flower than you would imagine sometimes, but videos are great too, and you can take screenshots from that later. Um, but if you want to participate in Bumblebee Watch, it's really fun and really easy. You just want to get a couple of different shots because we use a couple of different features of a bumblebee to identify it. So it's face, that kind of thorax part that I mentioned behind the head and that abdomen. Cause they got really cool patterns. Once you start looking at them, you'll see lots of different colors and shapes and all kinds of things on there. Uh, but it's really fun and it gets you a reason to go outside and start looking at nature. So can't can't do anything wrong there, especially uh, in a time where we were locked indoors for quite some time. <laughs> so true. So true. Um, so I believe that uh, we've posted the link of the, the plants that you, I think it's in the chat there now. So hopefully if anyone watching wants to check out what kind of native plants to plant uh, in their garden or in their, their natural spaces, uh, that's definitely a really good resource because native plants are really important because bees and other pollinators have co-evolved with those plants like they're the ones who are made for them so and like you could correct me if i'm wrong tiffany but it aren't there some bees that are like nectar robbers is that a thing that i read that's true <laughs> nectar robbers i'm not too sure to be honest no? so that's right I feel like I've heard the term before, but not quite in relation to bumblebees, maybe. I cannot for the life of me remember what species of bee it was. I just remember hearing about that there are some bees that actually rob like the nectar from flowers. As opposed to taking it from like the opening of where the nectar is, they like bite a hole through it and they're like, I'm just gonna steal that. Thanks. And it's like, oh you know what? that definitely sounds like something that would evolve over time. Someone just being like, This is more efficient for sure. Yeah. But yeah, I mean Megan makes a good point about the co evolution and um just a note on the plant sheet, I think it also shows you kind of what season they should bloom in. So it gives you kind of variety of when to plant them. But um, bumblebees have this technique and other native bees have this as well. But uh, for example, honeybees aren't able to do this. Uh, so bumblebees will buzz pollinate certain flowers. So it's really neat. They got really big, robust flight muscles, but they'll grab onto the anther. So kind of where they're containing the pollen of certain flowers and vibrate at such a high frequency they essentially like shake the pollen out of it like salt out of a salt shaker because some plants just really want to keep that pack tight in there so a good example of this is blueberries um blueberries require this type of pollination there's actually a whole group of plants that require this technique to be pollinated so for example if you were to put a bunch of honeybee hives on a blueberry farm yes there would be some pollination but it would not be nearly as efficient and effective with about half the amount of bumblebees versus a whole colony of honeybees. Uh, so it's quite interesting. They also do this a lot on rows. So if you ever have that around your house, um, you'll hear them buzzing. I've surveyed in areas um, that had all rows and I usually would hear the bumblebee before I see it because it's just sitting there buzzing on the flower. It's actually adorable. I suggest you look up a buzz pollination video because it's super cute. <laughs> I, I think I've seen that before where it was like, it was like the wild roses and I could hear something. I was walking by and I was like, what is happening? And you just sort of like peel the, the, the petals yeah. open and this bumblebee just like came out. I was like, okay, hi. <laughs> yeah, um, they don't make really noise on a flower. So if you hear them buzzing on it, it's specifically for that technique. Wow, I didn't know that there was a name for that. That's amazing. Buzz pollination. I or feel like sonic pollination is the, the fancier term. <laughs> well, buzz pollination is funnier. <laughs> uh, be, it's funny because like in honeybees, right, the bees have different dances, like the waggle mm -hmm. dance. I'm like, again, it's another funny, so buzz pollination, waggle dance. I'm like, this is all, all the kind of cute terminology, scientific terminology for, for bees. That's awesome. Um, on that note, do bumblebees do any sort of dancing or how do they communicate with each other? I don't know too much about how they kind of indicate some of those things. I think it definitely is quite a bit more well studied in honeybees, maybe because of the size of the colony, 
Um, we also know how to manage them a bit better. I mean, we do commercially manage quite a few, or sorry, typically uh, just one species of bumblebee here, the common eastern. But I'm not sure we really do that for studying purposes. It's for similar to the honeybee for like agricultural purposes. But I'm not quite sure how they they do that, how they interact. There must definitely be a similar equivalent um, in which how they indicate how far flowers are or what kind. Um, my colleagues and I always make jokes about what the queen's orders were today because sometimes they're not foraging on the plant they were yesterday. We think maybe the queen wants a different forage flower today. So I personally don't know. Um, I'm sure the knowledge is definitely maybe out there in articles, but it's definitely very interesting to think about when you think about how many workers can come from a single colony. Um, I think about that too. Um, when you start seeing workers come out and they're all the same species, are they from the same one or are they from different ones? You don't really know, but it is really neat to see them kind of collectively work together. Yeah. I, I was at a park this weekend and I was sitting sort of on the grass and there was just a field of white clover all around me mm -hmm. and there were honeybees and bumblebees everywhere like it was just amazing and it never stopped i was there for a few hours and it was like the whole grass was sort of not the grass like the the flowers like it was moving yeah. just a bee, <laughs> a bee and then a bee and then a bee and and it was just really really neat so i i love it i love it and and they just did their thing and i just sat there with them in the in this field of clover <laughs> yeah they're, they're hard workers for sure sometimes you'll start seeing too that they kind of differentiate in what they pollinate um we've definitely done several surveys where we see workers only pollinating the white clover but the queens are on something completely different so that's also neat and not sure if it's some sort of accessibility thing or whatever's happening but uh, this year has been actually particularly interesting they've had so much in bloom at the same time that actually finding what they're foraging on this year was quite a task um we've been doing this for many years and it's typically um willows really early spring quite the move to dandelion dandelion seemed to be very minimally accessed this year because there was so much in bloom around dandelion this year and other years dandelion is kind of that only in between source between you know that very early spring and summer so this year was quite a treasure hunt to find the today's forage flower as we call it <laughs> wow oh that's very interesting i know um like every year is probably different they, they're probably doing something in, in climate change and um you know our, our weather probably has a big impact on our pollinators too and we often don't don't think of them necessarily as being impacted by things like that. But uh, I know that as a beekeeper of honeybees, like I've seen some weird things going on with my bees as well. And it had a lot to do with just the this, this spring that we had. It started early and then it sort of just kept going. <laughs> yeah, it is definitely a weird year. I mean, each year that kind of um, phenology of the flower bloom is really quite changing, especially when as I mentioned, I normally station the crew up in Thunder Bay and, you know, the more north you go, things also shift back too. So trying to figure out when that's going to occur is hard. But like Megan said, it was a it was a very early spring this year. I don't know if you guys remember, but we didn't quite have that one last snowfall. We typically do the end of April, which is, and you know, hibernating bees, among many other hibernating species, use a lot of environmental triggers onto when they're coming out of that. So this year, for example, we started our surveys in May. So I think the first week in May, uh, sometimes it's the week before that. Uh, but in our very first week of surveys, uh, we found a worker, which is ridiculously crazy to me, who's done surveys for about four years in a row. Workers typically don't come out, I would say, until on the early side would be very end of May, um, maybe in that last week. But I would say like a peak abundance of workers is probably mid-June. So to find one in the first work of surveys is just crazy and just shows how far along some of the colonies already were. Uh, we do kind of have a few early emerger species, but they really capitalized this year. And um, in our last week of surveys, so this was probably maybe second week of June or so, because um, keep in mind, we're kind of trying to survey just those queens. We're trying to collect those queens before they initiate those colonies. So that kind of peak window is what we survey in. Uh, but we even found males in our last week of surveys, which typically I would say you don't see until at least July. So that was incredibly shocking. And they're out and about right now in high numbers already. So it's definitely a very accelerated year for sure. 
Oh, that's interesting. I wonder what kinds of impacts that will have for them overwintering and what that will mean for your your survey season next year. So that's so interesting. Um, so Tiffany, I'm curious, like what like what made you go into like doing this type of work? Like, did you always love bees or did you stumble upon it? Like, what's that story? Yeah, it was uh, a journey for sure. I mean, I, like many others, was kind of involved in that kind of very Save the Bees campaign, as you mentioned, but I was under that very large misconception as well that it was largely geared towards honeybees, which is actually not true. Honeybees aren't native and they're not really at risk like a lot of our native species are. Um, just like Megan, many people here are beekeepers and we use them for agricultural purposes, but they don't naturally belong here. They're not historically evolved here. Uh, so when you're thinking of save the bees and supporting pollinators, it should be our native bees like our bumblebees. Um, so I remember looking back on that now and thinking, boy, I barely knew anything back then. And um, at the time I was just graduating um, my undergraduate degree. So I did environmental studies at York and WPC had posted a lot of their kind of, um, they do a lot of spring internships or just kind of tech positions. So keep an eye out if you're interested. Uh, we have lots of great programs. And when I read the Bumblebee one, I actually remember thinking, wow, this sounds too researchy. This doesn't sound too fun at all, but I was interested. And I really kind of just fell into it. I mean, when I did the interview and I learned more about the program and what you were doing, I still thought, you know, this is pretty cool. And it was in my field. I always knew I wanted to work in something environmental. Uh, wildlife conservation would have just been a benefit. But man, that first field season running around catching bees, there will never be a time that matches that in my life. It was the <laughs> most exciting, adrenaline filled, like six weeks of my life. It was amazing. And I've come back every year since doing kind of new and interesting things for the program. And um, yeah, I love it. <laughs> That's awesome. I can only imagine what that would have felt like for sure. I love it. Um, okay. <laughs> so we don't have any questions, uh, although there is somebody who said beautiful creatures, and I agree. <laughs> um, bees are definitely amazing, and uh, one of my favorite parts about being a beekeeper and, and being a staff scientist here at Science North is getting to do these fun projects and talks with people uh, like you, Tiffany, and, and definitely like just watching them. I love just sitting and watching them do their thing. It's very peaceful, very relaxing. Um, mm. so that's, that's awesome. Um, yeah. so I guess, Great. I guess that the, we'll, we'll finish up, but the last question I have for you is, um, what, if there's one thing that you'd like everyone to remember from our chat today, what do you think that should be? Um, well, I think what we just went over kind of, you know, if you're really looking to support pollinators, I'd really look into the activities that really, truly beneficial those native ones. Um, if you're looking to do an apiary and such, really have your reasons for doing so. But if you're looking to support bumblebees or a lot of our other native species, you know, planting those native species, kind of leaving that nice area for them um, to nest and hibernate. You know, they, they need that two different times of the year. And then, yeah, I say you get onto Bumblebee Watch, start taking photos of bumblebees. It's super fun. Like Megan said, they're adorable. Trust me, when you start seeing them up close and how fuzzy they are, you will fall in love. I promise you. <laughs> I think it's a great way to get involved. And I think the more you just educate yourself and learn, uh, pollinators are a very big thing. There's tons of webinars going on about lots of different groups, not just bees. Um, I think the more you educate yourself, you can educate other people and building awareness is just as important. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, I believe that if you, again, this is, you know, if you want to check out our other social media platforms and definitely follow and subscribe, we, I know I made a, uh, a video about Bumblebee Watch and how to do, how to make observations on it earlier this year. While you were busy catching bumblebees, I was I was doing my little video uh, that we did for World Bee Day. So definitely go on our um, social media channels on YouTube and Facebook and check that out. And like I said earlier, definitely check out WPC's um, Instagram page and, and their website because there's all kinds of cool information that is really accessible and it'll give everyone a great 
great idea of how we can help our native pollinators because you guys don't just deal with bees. You guys deal with all different species of butterflies and moths and it's just amazing. So thank you so much for being here with us, Tiffany. Uh, I know that I'm, I'm very happy to continue working with you uh, <laughs> over the past couple of years and our Bumblebee Watch and, and all that jazz. So I'm excited. Thank you so much for being here and thank you everyone for watching as well because this was a fun chat and i hope you all have a fantastic day yeah Bye. thank you everybody for joining <laughs>